I'm DJ Alex, and this is your Hunky Vape 5 on Friday, Vaping News Science and Advocacy Report for the 18th of December, 2020. On the news today, Australian Medical Association and the Australian Council on Smoking and Health united today in holy matrimony to declare the Senate made the right call on vaping. Personally, I'd rather throw my thongs away and deal with the Bindi, Cat's Eye, and Three Corner Jack than accept that this report is good news. But at least nicotine importation with a doctor's prescription is still legal. Packaging and marketing, though, that's another matter. In Canada, it's unintended consequences from the Quebec Coalition for Tobacco Control. Flavor bans and tax hikes on e-liquids continue to hamper smoky sensation and foster a dramatic spike in ciggy sales. In Denmark, there are owls in the bog. How do I know this? The Danish parliament prohibited flavors other than tobacco and menthol and aims to reverse the decline in smoking rates by imposing a 32% tax on e-liquid, which translates to a 66% price increase for, va for vapors who can stand to use tobacco or pure menthol flavors. Meanwhile, China CDC study documents that 96.2% of e-cigarette users are now former smokers. In the US, regulators wrestle MMA style with flavored e-liquid rules. Five states have already banned flavors and created a thriving black market instead of driving people back to deadly combustible cigarettes. Oh, and despite the fear mongering, COVID-19 has not impacted vape sales volume, only the size of our checkout carts and the number of retail stores illegally selling safer nicotine products. For our science segment, we jump to the counterfactual. What's the right thing to do? Analytical advocacy, getting behind the rhetoric of campaigners. And speaking of advocacy, our highlighted advocacy groups for this week is the UK Vaping Industry Association and the World Vapors Alliance. Ain't nothing to it but to do it. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, right from the horse's mouth, the Australian Medical Association Majority Senate Report makes right call on vaping. That's their declaration. And they did it wholehandedly, holding hands with the Australian Council on Smoking and Health. They united today to strongly endorse the majority report from Senators Henderson, Uquart, Sheldon and Griff following the Senate inquiry into tobacco harm reduction. They say Australia is a world leader in reducing smoking and tobacco related harm and like the significant majority of Australia's leading health organizations, the AMA and the ACOSH strongly support a precautionary approach to e-cigarettes. They say that at this stage, there's insufficient evidence that nicotine delivering e-liquid actually helps people quit smoking compared to other cessation aids. That's not true. And there is strong evidence that they increase the risk of youth taking up smoking. That's not true either. We don't know yet what the long-term effects of inhaled heated liquids directly into the lung are, and we don't know what is in some of these vaping liquids. Well, I don't know what's in your underwear either, but it doesn't really matter, does it? The Australian government should continue to restrict access to e-cigarettes unless robust evidence emerges supporting their use as a quit-smoking aid. What is their definition of robust evidence? Huh? The majority report backs the TGA's interim decision to make liquid nicotine available on prescription only and recommends educating doctors about the ability to prescribe liquid nicotine as a quit aid. It also calls for more research into the possible effects of flavorings and additives to vape fluid. 
Why is that the only thing that they're focusing on? Oh, that's right. Because there's way too much evidence about the rest of it. Because it was researched back in the 30s. The 1930s. Many of the submissions received by the inquiry that supported making e-cigarettes more freely available repeated the arguments presented for this proposition by tobacco companies. Well, listen, there's an old saying. You go and dance with the bloke that brought you. Tobacco companies are what got people smoking cigarettes. So if that's who you have to associate yourself with when you're trying to quit smoking, then that's what you got to do. And just because they happen to be saying the same thing doesn't mean it's coming from the same perspective. The good news is, however, that they continue to focus on evidence-based strategies that have been proven to reduce the prevalence of smoking in both adults and children and reduce the burden of tobacco-caused disease on the health system and the community, which is what vaping does, if you look at the science behind it. Public Health England would not have said that vaping is at least 95% safer than smoking deadly combustible cigarettes if there wasn't data to back it up. However, that's not enough for them. They need to continue the scaremongering tactics because insufficient evidence that nicotine delivering e-cigarettes are efficacious, efficacious for smoking cessation, meaning effective for smoking cessation. That's why the latest study says that it's four, five times more successful than alternative nicotine replacement therapies. Right. They want to continue the scaremongering and the scare tactics. And for those of us in the United States, when we look at this packaging, we go, oh my God, I can never imagine our packs of cigarettes looking like this. But you know what? When you've got a whole shelf of cigarettes and they all look like that from a distance, you get immune to this kind of stuff. So this stuff has no beneficial effect on cigarette sales. Maybe the first week they put it out, but quite honestly, it's going to be the exact same effect that you're going to see on teens when they're constantly told not to vape. Don't do like everybody else is. Don't go out and vape because everybody else is already vaping. There's an epidemic. So the ones that have never tried it are going to be like, why is everybody else trying it? What's the big deal about it? So then we're going to go to the alternative approach once they realize that scare tactics don't work because panic is not a constant state. It's just something that happens when you scare the shit out of somebody, but then they come to their senses and go, okay, the flight or fight reaction is now over. Let's logically think this thing through. So then we have the alternative, which is just plain packaging. Nothing attractive whatsoever. Yeah. This is exactly what we're talking about. The fastest way to dumb down a population is simply to scare them. Mm-hmm. That's why Time Magazine decided that they needed to put a cover out. It says the new American addiction, how Jewel hooked kids and ignited a public health crisis. Public health crisis? The cancer rates in this country are not a public health crisis. The rates of heart attack, stroke, cancer, emphysema. Oh, those aren't health crisis issues because there's pharmaceutical companies making a fortune off of them. So, oh man, not a crisis. Jewel, crisis. Oh, we have to use this to get rid of people 
looking at vaping as an alternative to cigarette smoking because if all these people stop smoking cigarettes, where's our money going to come from? Unintended consequences. The Canadian Vaping Association has warned about anti-vaping policy changes that will result in increased smoking rates and negative health outcomes. It warned that the review by the Quebec Coalition for Tobacco Control could have serious unintended consequences. Serious unintended consequences that we've seen in how many other locations? Look at what happened when Nova Scotia decided they were going to tax the heck out of vaping and ban flavors except for tobacco and menthol. Oh, smoking rates doubled more so than they were before vaping came into existence. But they don't want to pay attention to that because that's not in their agenda. After pointing out that the number of things that the QCTC was calling for are already in place, the CVA added, time and again, it has been concluded that flavors are the driver for youth use and how that is a fallacy. The data continues to show that flavors are imperative for adult population and for continued cessation success while flavor bans have shown to result in an immediate increase in smoking rates and traditional tobacco consumption. It referred to findings made by America's Center for Disease Control and Prevention, where 77% of children questioned didn't state flavors as being the reason they tried vaping. Being curious about vaping was the number one reason why youth try vaping then from a study by researchers in yale university the cva quoted adults who began vaping non-tobacco flavored e-cigarettes were more likely to quit smoking than those who vaped tobacco flavors they continued to add to understand the harm that flavor bans cause to public health we need only to look to nova scotia didn't I just say that? Immediately following the province's decision to ban flavors, traditional cigarette sales experienced an unprecedented increase, prompting the president of the Atlantic Convenience Store Association to release a statement urging Nova Scotia to reconsider the ban, considering the dramatic spike in cigarette sales. Then addressing the issue of increased taxation, the CVA pointed to findings of a Minnesota study that found taxing vaping products would lead to an 8.1% increase in tobacco use and a smoking cessation decrease of 1.4%. The CVA respects QCTC's mission to protect youth from nicotine experimentation and addiction, yet it is crucial that Canadian government and QCTC alike understand that the CVA shares this goal. Independent vape businesses were created to solve the problem created by tobacco for adults. Although often wrongfully viewed as an extension of tobacco, the sole purpose of an independent vape industry is to help adult smokers reduce their harm by stopping their addiction to deadly combustible cigarettes. However, in Denmark, they have not learned, they have not done their research, and they are following the same tragic path. They're putting their head in the guillotine and going, go ahead. We, we love cigarette smoking sales. Apparently that's what they're thinking because they decided that effective April 1, 2021, new rules will prohibit the manufacture of e-liquids in flavors other than tobacco and menthol. They also imposed a new tax, 32% tax on e-liquid. 
which translates to a 60 per, 66% price increase to those vapors who are willing to continue vaping when the only choice they have is tobacco and menthol. Ugh. I'd rather vape at 100 watts on a dry mesh coil than you'd vape using menthol only flavoring or tobacco flavoring. Meanwhile, in China, their CDC has done some studies and say that non-smokers account for less than 4% of e-cigarette users in China. A study found that Chinese smokers account for 96.2% of e-cigarette users. E-cigarettes are not non-smokers' first puff. Their first puff comes from deadly combustible cigarettes. And because they can't stop using deadly combustible cigarettes, they look for a safer nicotine product a safer alternative to quit their deadly habit. Yep. You can take a look at this actual article yourself in Vape Hong Kong. Jumping back to the United States, U.S. regulators struggle MMA style with flavored e-liquid rules. Yep. The vapor industry continues to face several regulatory challenges. One of the most challenging of those is the never-ending battle against flavor bans for e-liquids. And as most any vapor will tell you, flavors are instrumental in keeping former smokers from returning to deadly combustible cigarettes. However, flavors are also what many industry regulators and anti-vapor zealots say lure youth to try vaping. It isn't all the advertising they're doing in schools that is leading them to vaping. It's the flavors. Yeah, we all know that to be not the case. However, Sometimes you do come across some really interesting information when you go and you read these articles. And I know that everybody's getting sick and tired of hearing the exact same thing. It's like a constantly beating drum. We all heard this before. This is the same shit you talked about last week. Well, I did come across something that was pretty interesting. Um, during this whole global pandemic situation, COVID-19 and lockdowns and stores being shuttered and basically forcing everybody into their own homes, you would think that there was a change in the amount of volume of sales for these vape products. There hasn't been. The only thing that really changed is the size of our checkout cart. Because see, now instead of us purchasing things at a local vape shop to get us through the next week or two, and then going back to that vape shop in a week or two and going, hmm, do I want to change flavors or do you still have that stuff I got last time? We're now forced to purchasing things online and from other locations. And when we do that, to make things a little more cost effective, we are dramatically increasing the size of our shopping cart from what we would normally purchase. Part of it is the savings from online stuff. And the other part of it is the fact that if we're going to be placing an order, let's do it once every month or two, or maybe even every three months instead of every week or two. That I thought was pretty interesting. And if you'd like to read any of the other stuff that's in this article, because it wasn't just one thing that was covered in here, like the fact that, you know, there's five states that have banned flavors, and you'll find that the same things happened that have happened elsewhere where they was banned, you basically create a thriving black market. And it isn't a black market of, you know, your typical ideology of, oh, there's a guy standing on the corner selling drugs, right? No. That's not where the black market exists. The black market exists in the retail segment. Here we are in Salina, Ohio, where the police department were going around 
doing some checks to see and verify that there were no underage sales of these items. And they came to find out that seven of nine businesses sell vaping products and they sell them illegally. And they sell them to underage youth. Where are these places you might ask? How about the Marathon gas station or the Sunoco station? Yeah. Or one of the other marathon stations in town or the tobacco shop. Because here's what happens. When you decide to ban something or to make it extremely impossible for somebody to sell a product because there is no approved list of what's legal and what's illegal in this country, people are going to sell it as long as they have a customer for it. And as long as consumers demand to have these products readily available, and as long as their clerks are getting asked by their customers, hey man, do you have any vape stuff? The business owner is going to go, oh, I'm in here to make a profit. So if my customers are asking for something, I'm going to find a way to get it and sell it to them. Yeah, that's continuing to happen. And when they lock down these businesses, guess what's going to happen? You're going to go and retreat them to friend circles and um, other places. Like, you're not going to find them in the gas station. You're going to find them in, like, the masseuse parlors, or you're going to find them in the computer repair shop down around the block. Because as long as consumers want a product, businesses will provide that product to them. Jumping over to our science segment, the counterfactual. This is a personal website by Clive Bates. You're like, who the hell is Clive Bates? Well, Clive Bates is a civil servant, or he was recent until recently was a civil servant. He was the director general with the Welsh government, and he has served with Greenpeace, Imperial College, and Emmanuel College in Cambridge, and uh, UNEP in Sudan, and the Welsh government, and a bunch of other places. However, he's got this website, and... The one page on the website is titled Nicotine Science and Policy Q&A. This was published earlier this year, and I found it to be very, very informative. So if you have any questions about nicotine and nicotine science and policy regarding nicotine or policy regarding tobacco harm reduction or safer nicotine products, this is a very valuable website to have in your little arsenal. It consists of about 60 questions and builds on a brief Q&A that he submitted in consultation and as a critique of an absurd anti-vaping Q&A by the World Health Organization. And his critique of numerous false and misleading claims made by no one other than Professor Stanton Glantz who is now retired because of all the retractions that he had to do. So, check out this website, check out the link. There'll be a link in the description below this article. The contents of which include strategy, what is the purpose of tobacco and nicotine policy, safety and relative risks, what are the risks of nicotine and nicotine vaping, Quitting smoking, do vapor products displace smoking, meaning do people quit smoking because of vaping? Youth, how we should address the uptake of adult products by young people? Regulation, should governments handle reduced risk products? Questions like should it be banned, should it be regulated like cigarettes or something else like a cessation aid or a medical product or pharmaceutical product? And he has his personal take and his perspective on things from his role in previous roles in government and academia. Vaping in public places, marketing, retailing. And is the tobacco industry pariahs, predators, or just simply a player? And rapid responses to the biggest myths about vaping. Jumping to that section, myths about vaping. They don't help smokers quit. 
Well, they helped me quit smoking. Cause cancer, heart and lung disease. Whoa! That right there had to hit the brakes on. I'm sorry. I know, but we're going to cover that before this report is over. So, on that note, let's jump right into our advocacy groups for this week. The advocacy group for this week that I chose was the UK Vaping Industry Association. More than 3 million smokers now vape, but 40% have not tried vaping yet. Actually, depending on what studies and what statistics you look at, the number of people that don't know about vaping is actually very alarming. You would think a technology product that has been out on the marketplace for 10 years, 10 plus years, would at least have individual recognition by the majority of everybody. Wouldn't you? Well, numbers do not lie. And realistically, there are so many people that don't know about vaping and there are so many people that have misconceptions about vaping because of the propaganda that's being shoved down people's throats. And the UK Vaping Industry Association is a group, a nonprofit organization run by its members for its members. They're about educating, informing, and reassuring key stakeholders as well as supporting the industry so that the shift from smoking to vaping continues unabated and the public health benefits of doing so are realized fully. Their primary stakeholders include policymakers, parliamentarians, regulators, and public health community, let alone the some 7 million smokers across the UK that need to quit smoking and could very easily benefit from vaping to quit smoking. And now we jump to our conversation about cancer. Here's an article published in the Parliament Magazine EU for European Union. And it is titled Endorsing Vaping to Successfully Fight Cancer. Cancer is the second leading cause of death in the European Union. 1.3 million people die from cancer every year. Therefore, the upcoming European Beating Cancer Plan is a historic opportunity to improve public health in Europe. But to be successful, the European Union must be brave enough to endorse new approaches. Vaping must finally be endorsed to beat cancer. Yeah, you heard that right. One of the major causes of cancer is smoking. Out of the 1.3 million people who die from cancer per year, 700,000 are associated with smoking. The European Parliament's Special Committee recently also acknowledged that tobacco use, in particular cigarette smoking, is the main risk factor for cancer death in Europe. And if you try and say that you don't live in Europe so this doesn't apply to you, you're nuts. Because the harms are the same regardless of what country you live in, what region of the world you live in, what part of the globe you happen to reside on. The facts are the same. Facts are facts around the world. How is it best to tackle smoking? For several decades, both governmental and NGOs have used various public health policies to stem the tide of smoking, including taxes, bans on advertising, promoting various patches, gums, and therapies to deliver nicotine in an alternative form that is less harmful to hopefully, hopefully, former smokers. Unfortunately, many of these alternatives have not proven to be entirely successful especially when you compare it to the efficacy of vaping. And why does vaping work so well? It's because of the flavor options available to the consumers. Every flavor imaginable is available somewhere for vaping.
Did you think about that for a second? Every flavor you could possibly imagine, no matter how good or how disgusting, is available for vaping. So regardless of what tickles your fancy, there's a flavor out there for you. And it might surprise you when you quit smoking what flavors actually appeal to you. And what flavors that you thought would appeal to you are actually kind of disgusting. And it's not going to be the same as the person standing next to you. It's not going to be the same as your spouse or your friends or your family because everybody's taste is individual. And everybody's vaping experience is individualized for that very reason. And that's why vaping products are so successful in smoking cessation. Therefore, we need every possible method available to them to make it, make quitting smoking easier and much easier. Because according to Public Health England, vaping is 95% less harmful compared to smoking. And the cancer risk relative of vaping to smoking is 0.4%. Yep. You know, vaping is already a recommended means of quitting for smokers in the United Kingdom and France. Outside of the European Union, both Health Canada and New Zealand's Minister of Health also recommend vaping to smokers looking to quit. Countries that adopt policies to reduce harm see better results in reducing smoking compared to more restrictive countries. An example of the latter is Australia, which was very harsh, has very harsh regulations on vaping, and sees a much slower decline in the smoking rate compared to the United States or the United Kingdom, which are more vaping-friendly countries. However, the battle continues and the fight continues, and the more regulations and restrictions that are placed on the residents of these locations, the numbers are going to get muddled. Because you cannot make generalized statements anymore like you used to be able to. However, it is time for the European Union to follow the lead of these countries. We should be led by science and not ideology on the issue. It should not be an elitist agenda that determines what the outcome of these regulations are. You need to do the humanitarian approach and acknowledge the fact that everyone has a right to health, a right to a safer option. World Vapors Alliance amplifies the voice of vapors around the world and empowers them to make a difference in their communities. The members of the World Vapors Alliance are vapors, associations, as well as individual vapors from all over the world. Take a look at their website. There'll be a link in the description below. Vapors, raise your voice. Raise your voice. Well, how about I raise my voice right now and you can watch me fill out one of their surveys to see how simple it really is. What is your age? Click on that. How many years have you been vaping? 1.5. Close enough. Why did you start vaping? Well, to quit smoking. Um, and for medical reasons. And because the flavor choices look so appealing. Technically, you can use it indoors too. Although that, I didn't know about that until after I quit smoking. To de-stress and for social reasons, um, not really. However, those of us, especially as we get older, have problems dealing with younger generations or just dealing with ignorant people or just dealing with stupid people. And nicotine is proven to be beneficial to preventing you from becoming depressed over things and to help you deal with social situations. And there's new studies coming out that the reason why there's so many people that take up smoking is to deal with psychological issues that they've had or are starting to have or could develop. But I digress. Let's get back to the survey. What flavors do you currently vape? Fruit flavors. 
desserts and sweets. No, no drink flavors. Definitely not. Uh-uh. Mm-mm. Menthol. Well, technically, the candy cane has menthol as a side component, but I could not stand to be any stronger than what it really is. What is your favorite flavor? Grape. What flavors did you start with? Um, dessert and sweets, I guess. I tried a couple different things. I tried a bunch of different things because nothing really seemed to be that appetizing to me. But I did have candy cane, and that's kind of the one that stuck and got me to quit. What would you do if flavors were banned and only tobacco flavor was available? I mean, besides puke? Uh, no, I would not quit vaping. And no, I would not quit smoking. I would definitely not vape tobacco flavors. Buy abroad from countries where flavors are allowed. Yeah, I would probably do that. And yeah, I would probably mix my own. Yeah, I'm actually thinking about starting to do that now. Where do you buy your vapes and e-liquids? Well, in a vape shop or where else should I buy it from? Or if it's closed, I could buy it online. Before vaping, were you a smoker? Well, of course I was. It's the only reason I started vaping in the first place. Did vaping help you stop smoking? Yes, I quit completely. 100%. Do you think vaping is more or less effective to quit smoking than other? It's definitely more effective. Because I tried everything else and nothing worked. Submit. There you go. It's that simple. So, if you're still watching this video, why don't you check out the link in the description below? It's the World Vapors Alliance, and there'll be a link in the description below. So, that wraps it up for this week. It is December 18th, 2020, getting ready for the Christmas holiday. I will be back next Friday with another Vaping News Science and Advocacy Report, and is my message, as always, keep on vaping. Thanks for watching.